Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meet the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you'll consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and speech writing needs. I am delighted to be joined today by Angel Rebo. We will be discussing how to reinvent yourself, pivoting in a crisis. Meet the Experts is sponsored by P&K CPAs. P&K is a full service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to businesses ranging from startups to small and mid cap companies to nonprofits as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at pk-cpas.com or call them at 973-882-8810. They will be happy to be of service. Angel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And obviously, thank you, everybody who's listening to us today. Well, the pleasure is mine. Please take a minute or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Thank you. Absolutely. So I am originally from Barcelona, close to Barcelona, but I've lived in Plano, Texas for the last 10 years, basically what I do for a living, I help, you know, both corporate CEOs and established entrepreneurs who hire me to bridge the gap globally for expansion and exposure as a way to accelerate the growth of their businesses. And I'm able to do that because, you know, before I started my own business five years ago, I had worked and I had helped more than 1500 CEOs in 33 different countries. Also, I think it's important for everybody to know that my passion is in uh, helping underprivileged kids in Latin America become entrepreneurs using their local resources. And I was blessed of uh, you know, joining a couple of uh, you know, business partners and friends of mine a few years ago. And we started Wisdom for Kids in order to do, to do that. So thank you for having me, Bruce. Well, it's my pleasure. Reinventing yourself and pivoting. How do you define pivot? Thank you. Well, I, I, when, I, when I think about pivoting, I actually, I actually think about these basketball players that, you know, when they are in possession of the ball, you know, they start moving one, you know, one leg is still, you know, in contact with, with the ground and the other one, they keep on moving it, you know, one, one side and the other. So, uh, and, and that's how I consider pivoting. Pivoting is actually, from a, in, a, in a business setup, for me, pivoting is like changing something in your life or, since, since, or changing something in your business but taking as a starting point what you have already developed and what you have already, you know, learned throughout time. So that's, that's how I define myself, pivoting. Now, if I can get through this without coughing, uh, why would you have to reinvent yourself? Is it really reinventing yourself or reinventing the business in a crisis? That's that's a great question. Actually, it very much depends on what's going on out there, right? I mean, we're talking about in times of crisis because when it's a crisis, there's some external events that oblige you to rethink about what you're doing and what you are offering to the market at that point in time. When something you know is so dramatic that it's called a crisis, then you start thinking, okay, so if the market has changed, if the conditions of the market have changed, so the clients probably are looking for something else or might need something different. How can I do it? And to your point, it might you might have to reinvent yourself. You might actually have to learn new skills. You might have to go down paths that you've never been before, yeah. or maybe not. Maybe you can just you know uh, expand what you already were providing to your clients or to your market, and take it from there. So really, it really depends on I would say how you have to pivot or how do you how do you have to provide additional products or services to the market. Let's take it. Two different cases and obviously the crisis that's in the background the 800 pound gorilla in the room is COVID-19 okay let's say we have a business an MSP an IT service provider now they have to deal with zoom they have to deal with cybersecurity at a level that they never had to deal with before. So maybe they're bringing on more people in a time when you can't all be in the office together, 
Some people are going to work from home. Some people have to go out because they're a field network engineer. And if you're a field network engineer, field means you go out. And if you're an engineer, you have to touch the, the gizmo. But your principles, your values, your ideals stay the same. You're just offering more. As opposed to a restaurateur who now has to lay people off and change the business model. The first case, they were just growing. In this case, they're changing the business model. We're no longer going to be serving food inside. People are going to come to the window or to the door, or we're going to rush out to their uh, car, and we're going to hand them their order. So the business model has changed. So describe for us the pivot and the reinvention as you see it in both cases. Okay, so gr great question. I love, I love when the rubber hits the road, Bruce. So I, I'm enjoying these conversations. So in the first case, well, let's not forget, first of all, Bruce, that not everybody likes to do everything. So it could perfectly be that there's an IT services company who's filled, right? Maybe they don't really like to provide the kind of services that the market is requesting. So that's a possibility. But let's say for the sake of the example, that this IT services company uh, is, is, you know, is, is, will, is, is willing to provide this service to their marketplace, right? So they're gonna probably have to learn a little bit more. They will have to learn additional skills because they will have to provide additional services. They might have to hire new people. I always like to consider that every single people thing has to take into consideration four different factors. Number one, your passion. Do you really want to provide that? Do you really like to do it? Number two, is there a market for that? You know, is there a is there a market? Do the, does the, or does the market place really want that service? Right. Number three, uh, your expertise, and that's why I was mentioning you know skills. Uh, do the people around you, do your friends, do your current current clients, do your prospects consider that you really know about that subject matter, so you can provide this service? And number four, the, the fourth pillar is, is the market going to pay for it? I mean, is it is it a service or a product that you're going to provide? In this case, it's an IT service company. Is there a is this service going to be paid for in the market enough so that you will be able to make a to make a living? So, and you you actually compare those two markets in a very in, in a very uh, obviously conscious way because IT services and high tech in general last year actually they thrive pretty pretty well. I've seen many public companies financial statements online on their websites and of IT services companies. And they did, they did really well because there was this whole bunch of additional problems that their, their customers faced, like the ones that you described, and they were open and willing to do it. They, were, they had the expertise to do it, right? So they put in place and probably had to recruit additional people. So they put in place additional people with additional skills and they started to, to think, okay, so how can we provide this service? So it is still, profitable for the company and we we provide it to our company to our clients in a way that is really going to help them be profitable don't forget that at the end of the day if your clients don't stay profitable it's 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 not really it's not ethical you were talking about values right it's not ethical to provide your clients with a with a product offer that is not going to still keep them you know profitable and uh, still offering or, or delivering value to their shareholders. So that will be example example number one. In, in the case of uh, example number two, which is a restaurant, right? So probably uh, as, 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 as example number one, you know, the clients still want, want that service, but they cannot have it face to face because of the restriction. So as you very well described, they changed the model. Let's go, let's revisit those four pillars, okay? So number one, passion, okay? So uh, is, that, is that business is still passionate about, you know, cooking food and offering food? Well, cooking, cooking food for sure, because you know that's what they used to do. But what about offering food? What about the interaction with the client? They will have to decide in this case if they're still passionate about changing their business model and offering that food, that service food or, or that food service, excuse me, in a different way. In this, in this case, probably it's going to be like they will, they will deliver it in the curb side or they will even partner up with another company to provide it to their end clients through these home delivery services, right? So that's one thing. The second is... The expertise. So, do they really know how to do it? How will they have to do it? What are these additional skills 
of, you know, are they, will they have to adapt their kitchens? Will they ha have to adapt the rest of the, you know, of the facility in order to make it more suitable for the kind of services that they're going to provide their cl clientele, right? That's, that's very important. Number four, um, is there a market for this? Obviously, I think that we all keep on eating, right? We all keep on eating. And I think that we all still have disposable income in general, you know, the clients of the restaurant, based of the restaurant industry, we all have disposable income. And we still want to, you know, hey, today I don't feel really like, you know, cooking or I don't really feel like spending so much time in the kitchen. Why not buying somewhere else? Why not? Maybe we can go to that restaurant face to face. We cannot sit, you know, on a table, but we can still, you know, grab something or we can have some of those intermediary companies to buy that from us and we can have it. And number four, it's the market. Is the market going to pay for it? Definitely. I think that uh, we have seen over and over again since last year that everybody was willing to pay this additional amount of dollars, whatever percentage it was, in order to have this amazing food, this, those delicacies that they would love to eat on site to still have them delivered to the place. So that those would be kind of how, how would I approach from a pivoting or, or reinventing perspective the, the times of crisis. Thank you. Now I want to talk about two other things. Of course. Basically longevity. Continuing with food, we've now become used to delivery services. Yeah. I have three blocks over there, a very nice diner that I used to go to occasionally. Okay. I haven't been there since February of what, 2020. Okay. All right. Next week, I get my second Pfizer shot. From what I've heard, I'm not going to be feeling very well next week. Okay. But the week after, I may decide, okay, I now am supposed to be safe. I'll go in and I'll get something to eat. First time eating out. But I've also had the necessities of life delivered. For example, a pastrami sandwich. All right, I can't get a pastrami sandwich at the diner. They don't know what pastrami is. It's <laughs> not good. I tried. <laughs> Other things are good, not the pastrami. So there's a kosher deli, and I can get it delivered. It costs a little bit more. But there will come a time when people will say, you know what? Let's go out and eat. Let's not get delivered. There are going to be fewer deliveries. On the other hand, I very much like the idea of the supermarket delivering my food so I don't have to carry a lot of heavy bags. That, for me at least, is going to continue indefinitely. You're providing services based on a crisis, and once the crisis is over, how do you keep your clients utilizing those services? Because those services are going to remind you of the crisis, which well, you want to forget. I think that, well, number one, there's uncertainty, right? We're talking about uncertainty in the marketplace. So mm -hmm. I, I think that we still don't know for how long, let's say, these business models have to be in place. For how long or have the, are those, going, those business models going to be in place? or those different ways to provide services and products to their clients. I think that we still don't know. So maybe the question is, I think that, and, and I, I'm gonna relate to what typically, typically happens when someone is launching a, a startup, some entrepreneur is starting their own business. Uh, I think that the most important thing is always being in touch with the market. There's something called like the minimum viable product, you probably, and, and, or service, you're obviously familiar with that. I think that being in touch with your client, consistently with your client is gonna be, is gonna give you the answer to what you just asked me. I think that really knowing what people are, are going to be comfortable in, in, in the future is gonna be key. What I would personally do, and I would suggest probably my clients to do is, hey, how are you keeping in touch with your client right now? Do you really know exactly the demographics of your, of your client? Do you know where they are located? Do you know what kinds of services? Probably if they have some system in place, some you know, point of sale system in place, they will probably know who is typically buying what? And that's what's called the market intelligence, right? They already know their customer base, what are their habits of what they are buying or what they are eating, 
how they are doing it, uh, how often, on which time frames, right? So all that market intelligence, the customer base intelligence, they, if you are a company that really cares about being in touch and knowing exactly what the market uh, is asking for, I think that you will be able to really serve that way. So obviously you have to plan, you have a business and you have to plan. I think that right now, being flexible about what you're planning and the decisions that you make according to the operations, you asked me about the operations also as well. I think it's going to be the wise, the wise thing to do. There will be people that are gonna stay on a place where they still feel more comfortable having everything delivered. And there's gonna place, there's gonna be people that will feel easily or easier, more you know, prone to go back to their former habits, right? So I think there's a, still a question mark to be able to answer your question. And we have to be ready as never before to, to be able to cope with the uncertainty and with the continuously changing habits of our consumers. That's excellent regarding services, but let's talk about products. And there's only one product that I can think of. Two feet away from me, maybe three. So to make you comfortable, a meter away from me are two gaiters. You know, the masks that uh, don't have the uh, strings for the ears. Okay. The three original blue masks that everybody bought uh, a year ago, two black masks that I shouldn't have bought on Etsy. And once it's over with, I don't need any more masks because I can wash the gaiters. The other ones, for whatever reason, I haven't thrown away. I probably should. I doubt I would use them. Uh, there are companies now that most of their income are from masks. And that demand is going to disappear. So how do they pivot with their inventory, with their machinery, to something new? Because people are not going to want to wear masks forever. I agree. So we're talking about um, people are not going to wear masks forever and probably they already feel comfortable with a specific kind of mask more than any others, right? So there, there will be a lot of, let's say, free uh, use masks in the market. So that's in, in itself, it can be also an opportunity, but let's, let's skip that. So number one- well, No, I, I gotta stop you. No one in their right mind is gonna use a used mask. Yeah, yeah no, 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 no. Only no. yes, but somebody else's, no. No, no, but just, we're just thinking about the, the, re, the recycling part of the oh. disposing, of the disposing. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. No, 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 that's, yeah. it's, it's all good. For the sake of the exercise, it's a, it's, a, it's a great conversation. So, you know, they have, number one, don't forget that these companies are having an income right now because they have clients. So even if it's a product as opposed to a service, these guys already have some clients and they talk, they're supposed to know exactly what the clients need today and what they're going to need in the future. They have established already some business relationships and there's some loyalty from those, you know, those clients towards those vendors, in this case ourselves, right? So I think that it would be wise if they started to think what, according to their experience and according to that relationship, if they start to talk to their clients and know, okay, so whenever, whenever, you know, this, you know, I don't know if to call it wave or bubble goes away or it, you don't need as many as before. What do you think? that you know, we could provide you with. We, I think we think we understand your business, but you know, what do you think you're gonna need? Again, uh, and there's, as, you, as you know, probably not everybody has an inventory. A lot of people are just you know, brokers or intermediaries, right? So it depends really on what, what your business model is. But what I would be doing is, okay, so if I've been able to provide you with this kind of product, okay, what about Mr. and Mr. Customer? What about these other products? that is related, that maybe, you know, I can use similar ways for manufacturing it, but it still can provide, a, 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 you know, it, it still can provide a service. I remember in the beginning of this crisis, we talk about masks today, but we could talk about, you know, probably like gels, you know, and, and many other things that are that a lot of different companies, even automotive industry started to, you know, as you remember, manufacturing different products, right? In order to use their spare, you know, uh, production uh, capabilities in, to, to fulfill the market needs, right? So I think it's gonna, it's gonna be the exact same thing. Uh, 
but the difference is that you, you made an statement, which is we're not going to need as many masks in the future. So I think that this is a, a, lower, a lower level of uncertainty compared to what we said before. So I think that you can plan for a downtrend in the market of a specific product, and you can start thinking about, okay, so my production facility, in, in case it's my own production facility, how can I repurpose it so that I can have, try to have the same clients use a different product that can be of service to them moving forward, right? And that's why I think that as far as you really own the relationship with your clients and with your market, you are really in a very good position to pivot and to offer and to manufacture other products that can be of service. The only thing, I'm not trying to be funny here, but I have been able to think of is what else comes with a cloth and a string. And the only thing I could think of were parachutes and bibs and two more divergent products I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that you would want to be in a plane and jump out of the plane knowing that your parachute was manufactured by the company that manufactured the bib that your child wears. All right, but maybe, maybe. I, I agree. As, as you know, it's a matter of certification, right? You will have to make your, you will have to plan. You will have to have a business plan in place and you will have to decide if all these additional, you know, things that you have to do in order to be certified uh, to serve, you know, a, a similar kind of audience with a completely different product. I mean, again, it's a matter of what are the habits, what are the consumption habits of that market that you already have in place, of that's those clients that you already have in place. But to, to your point, uh, I mean, nobody will allow you to sell another product unless it's it's gone through all the different you know due diligence or the process, the due diligence process that is is is, is necessary. Um, but I think that there has been a lot of uh, creativity and a lot of innovation in the market for the last 12 to 14 months due to the need to serve a different market or a market with different needs. And I think that that's, that's, that has really been a very good thing. And I think that entrepreneurs and companies in general, they have learned so much about you know, uh, the theory of constraints, things like what are the constraints in my business? How, do, how can I, how every single you know, business decision impacts the profitability of the company. These kind of things, I think that all those conversations have taken place. They have not taken place in, in many corporations, but they were a need last year. And, and, and I think that that has obliged a lot of companies to decide what route to take in many different directions. And I think that all these you know, thoughtful processes and all those uh, you know, brainstorming sessions that happened throughout the, the last year are going to make the companies much more profitable moving forward. I think that business owners and CEOs have become much more conscious of how every single decision impacts and has a consequence on the business profits. The final question, which I ask all my guests, what haven't I asked you that you wish I had asked? <laughs> well, I think that you're a very funny uh, person. I really enjoy the different, uh, you know, cases that your questions that you ask me. Probably, bro, you should have asked me what's the most funny question every anybody has ever asked you. <laughs> okay, what's the funniest question anyone has ever asked? You? <laughs> so probably, uh, probably, what was the funny question besides the the comparison that you made with the parachutes which was was which which ranks really high in the list of questions i've been asked uh -huh. um probably one of the questions is who would be who would be the three the three people that you would seed on a on a on a dinner table that's 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 one of probably one of the funnest oh. the funniest ones because i really like to have i mean that's I, actually not a funny question that's a good question but I, I i will tell you why it's a funny question because i love so much to eat and to cook so for me, it's real fun to think about working and or, or thinking about who would I share specific plates. And for me, a table is, a, is, is, is almost like a sacred, excuse me, sacred place where lots of magic happens. 
and were actually sitting to, next to someone and knowing and establishing that relationship around food, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's really a magic place where lots of things get accomplished. But would you choose, I, and I can't think of any offhand, a um, famous chef? Would you choose a famous scientist? Would you choose a famous entrepreneur? And would the three of them have to have something in common so that they could have a good conversation? Or would this just be, you want to have three separate conversations? Great question. Absolutely amazing question. Uh, probably the, any of the three would have anything in common as far as their field of expertise, but I think that they all three would have, literally they all three would have su such a generic wisdom and background that would allow them to have a conversation among us four. That's what I think. So it, will, it wouldn't probably be a, ch a chef. Uh, I, I really know a very good chef that has had many, many uh, Michelin uh, you know, forks in Europe, back in Europe, many restaurants, very, very, but I actually would, let, let me answer the question if I may. So the first person I will have on the table would be myself seven lifetimes ago. I apparently was a, a, a knight Templar, a te, excuse me, a Templar knight, Templar. A, te, a Templar knight, excuse me, I said it the other way around. Uh, that's, that's one person that no, would be myself. No, actually it's, they're called the Knights Templar. Okay. You had okay. it right the first time. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you okay, for correcting me. So you're protecting me. the Holy Grail. You've got your sword. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's one. And it's myself. So I would love to talk to myself, you know, okay. seven, seven lifetimes ago. The other person would be whoever is running the, the show in the world, you know, whoever that person or group of person, maybe one of them, I would love to have that whoever that is, you know, sitting next to me. I would love to be one part of the conversation. And the third one, uh, would be Jesus, and maybe not for the obvious reasons, but the reason for me would be because I think that typically the, the history books are written by the ones that won, you know, won the wars. So mm -hmm. I would love to have first-hand access, first access to Jesus so I could really have those tough conversations about, did you really write that? Did you really say that? Did you really do that? I would love to have that conversation. And I think that these three individuals, all together could have a very, very nice conversation. What do you think, Bruce? I think that it would be nice up until the end, what you said about Jesus, because I am assuming, and then you shouldn't make assuming, uh, assumptions that you are a nice Catholic boy. <laughs> and that what happens when you ask Jesus, did you really say, did you really do? Did this really happen? And he says to you, no. Then that would impact you on a very deep level. So sometimes it's best not to know. <laughs> I found, you know, it's very disappointing. Um, we'll end on this. Churchill was supposed to have said to um, he was he was stopped by a woman at a party, a lady, and said, uh, and she said to him, uh, Winston, you are drunk. And he said, Madam, you are ugly. The difference between us is tomorrow morning I will not be drunk. And then <laughs> the, then it was whether or not he continued the reason that you're laughing but according to one of his biographers it never happened i want that to have happened because it's a great story but enough we've really got an off topic and before i let you go i want to thank you again and please tell our viewers how they can best get in touch Absolutely. So thank you. My name is Angel Ribo. Last name is Ribo, uh, spelled like R-I-B as in boy, O. My brand is the CEO Confident, T-H-E-C-E-O-C-O-N-F-I-D-A-N-T.com, the CEO Confident.com, and you can go there. That's my website. And the easiest way to reach out to me is actually through my email, either my team or myself. We're going to answer any single email we receive. And my email address is angel at 
Angel Rebo, one word, angelrebo.com, angel at angelrebo.com. And thank you so much, Bruce, for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening to us. It was my pleasure. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching. And as always, please stay focused on success.